welcome back so it is january 30th and we are here in yorktown in virginia getting ready to explore and check out all the history this town has so i am bringing you guys along with me let's go all right our first stop is going to be at the american revolution museum at yorktown advantage. We cannot give them the opportunity to rally. Charge bayonets! He is fenced in as good a line as troops can move. I thought the militia would not fight. My God, they did today. The militia and backwoodsmen gave ground.
right, so everything that I showed you guys was just what I was able to get because a lot of displays have stickers that say no photography and other areas were just packed with people so I didn't want to record there. But now we're outside in the outside area and we're going to check things out. So want to want to see the musket go off? <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So what I have here is an example of a flintlock musket. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about it first. I'm going to kind of describe it, how it works, and then I'm going to give you plenty of warning for actually pull the trigger. But what we've got here, as I said, is a flintlock musket, which is a sharp stone which is called flint, striking into solid steel called the hammer in order to create a spark. That spark is what ignites the gunpowder that sits in the priming pan here. When the gunpowder in that pan explodes, it would pass through a small vent to ignite the main charge. When the gunpowder in the main charge goes off, that explosion pushes the bullet out the barrel of the musket. For a soldier that's properly trained on how to use one of these muskets, he should reliably be able to hit human-sized targets at a distance of roughly 80 to 100 yards. Of course, that's under good conditions, and battlefields are very rarely good conditions. So we don't have a whole lot of high hopes for the very high accuracy of the soldiers. Um, there are weapons even in the 18th century that can shoot more accurately and further than this weapon. It's not really its main feature. It can, however, load faster than almost any other shoulder-fired weapon at that time. It takes about 15 seconds to load. Um, that said, 15 seconds in a combat situation, a bullet's risen by your head is going to feel like a really long time. So this is ultimately considered to be a fairly short-range, slow weapon. Uh, however, it's not really intended for one soldier to be able to accomplish much on his own. It's really not how warfare is fought with this weapon in this style. Not that it is now either, but you're going to have a lot less effect as an individual soldier uh, in the 18th century even then. So the soldiers are going to rely on large numbers of soldiers fighting together in order to be effective. And part of that comes from the fact that these weapons are fairly easy to produce. They're fairly low in cost. They're easy to train a person how to use. They also have standardized, or as close to standardized as they can get, barrels, which allow them to make ammunition that is pre-measured and pre-sized so that every single thing will fit. And the soldier doesn't have to worry about any of his ammunition not working uh, or having to make any of it himself. This ultimately means that this weapon is going to be a lot more effective in those larger numbers because I can give more soldiers more guns with more bullets and ultimately make them more useful. But it does require organization. If you've ever seen any depiction of the revolution, you probably get an idea as to how they fought. Um, seeing movies, television shows, paintings where soldiers lined up shoulder to shoulder on open battlefields, usually in about two rows, facing the enemy off open ground. And typically the reason they're doing a lot of that has a lot to do with the weapons they're issued. In fact, there are other soldiers in the 18th century who are issued different weapons and different equipment, like uh, cavalry or men on, so men on horseback, or you have riflemen, or you have artillerists. artillerists. They're going to fight differently because they have different equipment. But they're also elites in small numbers versus a weapon like this, which is much more available and issued to much larger numbers, and so most soldiers are fighting in the linear formations. Part of it has to do with some of the weaknesses of the weapon. That limited range, for instance, means that if you actually want to hit an enemy reliably at a distance, 
having a lot of men firing simultaneously is going to give you a better chance of accomplishing that. And any of the bullets that miss still go whizzing by the enemy soldiers' heads. It still produces a big cloud of smoke in front of them. There's still that roaring sound of the cannon of the musket fire over them. So how do you think that makes me feel? Well, excited? Ready to take the next volley? <laughs> nah. Of course, if you uh, are able to convince the enemy that this is not a place they want to be and they abandon the battlefield, uh, even if you didn't hit anyone, that's still an effective way to win a battle because the enemy is now no longer fighting you. As long as the enemy's not shooting at you, you win. Um, and so these are ways in which we can accomplish victory without even having to get close enough to actually hit a whole lot of things with the musket. Of course, if the enemy is brave enough to get close enough to get hit, big wall of gunfire is a lot better at hitting things than anything else. And so it's certainly going to make life really hard for them if they try to get close to us. That said, if you want to get close to the enemy, you do have to make sure that you are able to maneuver on a battlefield because you don't want to get them head on if you can avoid it. You might have to in some cases, but most of the time, attacking from the flank, attacking from behind is a better option. And that requires mobility. It requires the soldiers to have the ability to, to move about a battlefield. But that also requires them to have cover and protection because it does take them 15 seconds to load their guns and they have to move around a battlefield. That's a lot of time they're not shooting. So by fighting as a group, you are able to, dis to uh, break up the responsibility of shooting amongst different soldiers. You can have a group of soldiers over there, a company over there fire, a company over there fire, a company over here fire, a company over here fire. By the time we're back to my company, not only have I had time to reload, but potentially also move the unit to a better position to fire from, ultimately giving them the ability to fight more effectively in the 18th century. And it also requires training and it also requires communication. In the 18th century, communication does not involve radios or cell phones or electronic communication of any sort. There's no instantaneous way to communicate information very easily. So usually relying on officers nearby to the soldiers who understand what's going on to instruct the soldiers on where to go, what to do, and how to do it. But that can, of course, be an issue as well. Even though the officers are closer to the men since they're all packed in closer together, they still might not hear the, soldier, the officers, but the soldier in a line has the men around him in the, in the part of the line to follow them if they know what they're doing. So somewhere further down the line, someone did hear the officer because at some point the officer's standing next to someone screaming into his ear, and everybody else can follow what those men are doing and allow the group to work together as a group, um, at least better than they would have alternatively. And ultimately this will all break down, but you're hoping that it'll break down on the enemy side first and not on yours. Uh, ultimately though, the, the musket is, is one tool that when used in larger numbers is more effective than it could be on its own, but it's not the only weapon issued to the soldiers. The uh, soldiers also shoot that bayonet, which in large numbers can accomplish things that it can't accomplish on its own. On its own, it's a five foot stabbing implement that if you get close enough to use, can be used also against you. So you prefer not to have to get close enough to use it, but in a wall of men with spears, you can stop cavalry charges, and at close range, you could eventually get close enough to the enemy that you can get to them faster by running at them than they can load their guns. And if you see a massive wall of men with spears come screaming across the open ground at you with those bayonets pointed, are you going to want to stick around and see if you can load guns faster than they can shoot their, or run, that, run across that field? I wouldn't want to try it. So another reason you might want to use that bayonet is, again, this is a weapon of intimidation by fighting large numbers together as a group. But it does require practice, it requires training, so in order for these soldiers to use this weapon effectively, they would have to go through fairly rigorous training as much as they are capable of, um, and control really the things they're capable of controlling. They're not necessarily going to be great at controlling where the bullet goes, there's not a lot of things they can do to control that fast. You can control how fast you load the gun, because that's all within your own capabilities. And so the officers would train the soldiers with repeated motions, again and again and again, how to load the gun so that even under stressful situations, they could do so reliably in a short amount of time. There are 12 steps that are given to the soldiers to teach them how to load their muskets. The first command is half cock fire lock. That's a safety. From here, we can give the command handle cartridge. Open up the cartridge box and pull the cartridge out. This will contain the gunpowder as well as the bullet. Rip the top of the cartridge off and give the command prime. Put some gunpowder into the pan. Shut pan. Close the pan. Bring the weapon to the side. Charge with cartridge. Pour the remainder of the gunpowder into the barrel. The bullet will be in that paper tube. Just drop that in along with it. Draw rammer. Pull the rammer out. Ram down cartridge. Seat the cartridge at the base of the weapon. Return rammer. Put the rammer back to its place in the stock, shoulder fire lock, and that signals to the officer that you are now ready to fire. From here, there are the three commands to fire given by the officers. The soldiers would then go through that process. If you don't like loud voices, this is a good time to cover your ears. Hey, ready? Take it! Fire! Time to load. load's given. How long did I say it should take to load? 15 seconds. About 15 seconds, right. soldier firing one musket on a battlefield there may be hundreds or even thousands of these being fired at once but hopefully it gives you an idea of how these weapons work and how they're being used
Now that concludes the demonstration of the musket, but if you have any other questions, if anything you All want right, to... so there you go. That was pretty interesting. I'm so curious to look inside these little tents. They look very comfortable. Check out these tents, Dina. Do you like them? All right, there's just a chair and a desk and a few of these trunk looking things. Well, this one has a little bed inside of it. interesting you guys if you guys ever come to Virginia make sure you come to Yorktown come to the museum check everything out so nice was really really good and very interesting information especially about Yankee Doodle we didn't know that story right that's right What's the now story? We're, oh well <clears throat> I don't know can't remember right now but we're gonna the go to British, these little oh. the British wrote it to make fun of us because the, the British wrote it to make fun our of our uniforms us. were and we they said we wrote on phonies <laughs> and we adopted the song there you go. To make fun of them. All right, so now we're going to go look at some little houses down here. I guess that's where they used All to right, live. So these are just the houses in that era. I like them. I would totally live in a little house like that. Oh, we got some chickens and we have a rooster right over there. How awesome. Tobacco leaves? Oh, that made him excited. Drying out tobacco. Look at that. It's a bunch of tobacco. That's cool. Got a little bed right here. This one is so cute and has a little garden. Wow. See how the fence is a lot tighter to keep rodents out? Yeah. Like it. Look at that. How cute. Can we go in there? Drying the foods out, getting stuff ready. Look at the beans. Oh, wow. Cabbage. So interesting. Oh, wow. The cabbage is perfect right 
We got some cabbage growing. Perfect weather for it too, it's all wet. We got a little workshop over here. Little smashers. Mm-hmm. What would they smash, Corn? Oh. Yeah, look at those are seeds. more little houses over here we're gonna walk into we're gonna be eating dinner around noon what time of day do you guys normally eat dinner six. i got a six do i hear five So we have a separate kitchen where all the cooking and all the food stuffs are stored. So have a look around. You can also welcome to go through the kitchen garden. There's the shed, the enslaved uh, people's house, uh, and then the uh, tobacco farm. And if you have questions, just uh, seek us out and we want to have that. You're welcome. Bye bye. So that is it for this site. Off to the next. All right, our next stop is the Yorktown Battlefield. We're going into the visiting center first to get a map. All right, so we're gonna be going on a driving tour and guess who's driving? I am, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to film anything. Let me pull over. Oh, there's okay. There's a bunch of pullouts. All right, so there's a bunch of pullouts. So I'll be showing you guys what we see. All right, so this is where we are at right now. And we're gonna go check it out. We have some cannons over here on the side. Let's go look.
second one. And then there's your tank. All right, so this is where we are at now. Second LACs line in the cemetery. It was constructed under the cover of darkness, October 11th and 12th, I think. All right, we're going to go check out the cemetery now. Yeah, they did this at night. This person died here in 1862. Sixty four. Walk on this little trail here. So I've noticed that people leave coins or pennies. Eighteen sixty four. Oh wow, this guy died in 1913. Wow, he died on my birthday. April 22nd, that's my birthday. Aww. And then this person here was born in February 10th, 1850, died September 20th, 1920. I don't know about you guys or if you guys are gonna think this is weird but I like walking in cemeteries I like checking out all the uh, tombstones and see how old they were when they died obviously I don't know how they died but I like walking in cemeteries and checking tombs out or the headstones and um, <clears throat> this one here is very interesting because it's crazy how long ago they died. I mean, many, many years ago. These um, tombstones are like so old looking. Some of them don't even have a year. Oh, this one here says two unknown soldiers. So there's two soldiers here and they are unknown. How sad. There's two more right over here. I guess they would bury them in twos. Alright, so like I said earlier, I'm not exactly sure why people leave coins or pennies on top of these tombstones, but I'm going to leave one on the tombstone of this guy that died on my birthday. Rest in peace, sir. There we go. I put a quarter there. I'm going to have to look that up and find out why people leave coins on these tombstones.
hide in here so they couldn't come across it. Wow, that's cool. So they'd have to jump out over and stab them through the thing. this little tree there it looks like a deer standing in the bush there isn't that crazy that's pretty cool check this out you guys it looks super cool probably way more prettier in person but doesn't look spooky we're heading to surrender field is that what it is yeah yeah surrender field but check this out so pretty 